Imagine a world where anything is possible. Imagine being able to see things working together for good, charged with sparks of infinite connections, fueled by a mysterious, wholesome, inexhaustible source of life. This unstoppable force, like a cresting wave about to break, stronger than all that is broken and corrupt, bringing together pieces of this world and this life that has long ago disintegrated and just about vanished. Power that only builds and heals and restores, never tainted by evil, never wavering in boldness, never interrupted by selfish ambition or man-made agendas and systems, pure, incomparable, immeasurable, life-changing. Imagine this power. Now imagine this power in your life flooding every corner of your being and existence, breaking through brokenness and bringing healing, bringing together the scattered parts of your soul and raising you to life as you never knew possible. Can you imagine the power of God working in us like that? Have you experienced what that flow of his energy through you feels like? Read with me from Ephesians 1 verse 19 to 23. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of his church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. May God flood our hearts with light so that we can understand and grow in a deeper knowing of what life with him is and can be like. So as we reflect on today's scripture and consider that he is called the one who strengthens, we can firstly acknowledge that God is the source. The words used here in the scripture are completely hyperbolic. Paul is intentionally using carefully chosen words to describe to us the magnitude of God's power being incomparable to any earthly power. He attempts to create in us an imagination for the immensity of God's power. I mean, he uses dunamis, power, where our word dynamite comes from, energia, energy, kratos, power, ischus, strength, and then descriptive words to try to explain the immensity of his energy flowing from his power into us. I understand verse 19, something like this. The more than all others, mega dynamite power of him poured into us who believe through the energy of his powerful strength. I think Paul was saying that the super mega mega dynamite power of God exists in us and it gives us an energy unbeknown to man apart from God. God's power gives us an energy we cannot create or generate from within ourselves because the energy source it came from was never created. God is the source of this energy and he always was. Everything else was created out of something else. And this energy source, God, not only created out of nothing, but he created out of negative energy. He recreated in bringing back life from death. Organisms brought back to life from that which had already deteriorated and disbanded. In this way of life that Jesus, Paul, and many who have gone before us invite us to, we discover that in turning towards God, we turn towards the source of power who creates a surge of energy that moves us, that charges us into life. And if we doubt that he is the source, try moving away from him and notice what happens. Yes, you keep existing and keep going through the motions, but it isn't the same. You only have you and what you can muster up to find or create meaning. And slowly you dwindle, life dwindles. 
and questions begin to nag at your soul. Why am I really here? Does my life have meaning? Every day feels just like the day before. What is the point? The reality is that you can't deny the light and heat of the sun. Look at the plants who know to turn to the sun for energy so that photosynthesis can take place. How do they know? Do they debate or grapple with the truth of the sun's existence or do they simply turn to the source? Look at the birds who migrate for winter or the animals who hibernate and then they come out when spring dawns. How do they know that the sun is vital for life? They just know. So too, God is the source of life. You can turn towards him and take him all in, or you can turn away and hide from him. And yet, he will still exist, still be the source, still be vital for our existence. And God, as source of incredible power, is generous in that he doesn't keep this power contained within himself, but opens up so that it may flow into us. He energizes us. God's power has the potential to do something. We see him energizing us in what his power does. We see the effect of his power. And it's not simply mind-boggling, but death-breaking. In Ezekiel, God's breath brings dry bones to life. Flesh and tendons form around them, and they come to life and stand up on their feet, a vast army. I mean, can you picture the scene as death is transformed to life? We can only measure his power in resurrection units because this res resurrection power conquers death, spiritual death, physical death, and eternal death. And what is death? Death is the lack of coherence, the disintegration of parts that would previously form an organism a whole. When you're dead, you can't integrate, you can't respond since you're not sensitive to any stimuli, and you can't do anything. So if we look further than physical death, we recognize that when we're spiritually dead, we're disintegrated. This means your life is full of splitting, where this part is not connected to that part, and this part has no effect on the other. You may be completely unaware of why you're struggling to feel connected and content, but perhaps it's just because you have decided at some time or another that the part of your life that has to do with God is fine, but that the other parts of your life and who you are are none of his business. They're yours to worry about. This splitting of spiritual, social, emotional, and physical life is not only unsustainable, but unfulfilling. Splitting, disintegrating, incoherence in the compartments and elements of your life are signs of decay. You're not living as the holistic body, mind, and soul person you were created to be. Spiritually dead also means you're no longer sensitive to the stimuli around you, and you can thus not respond. Perhaps this is where you feel that God has gone silent, or nothing meaningful is happening in your life. You don't see beauty, you don't experience joy, you don't feel love or compassion. You are not moved by forgiveness and grace. You're not unsettled by injustice. Nothing prompts you to a response of any kind because you have become desensitized or completely numb. And being spiritually dead means you can't exert yourself, you can't do anything. You feel you can't read the Bible, you can't pray, you can't worship, you can't give of yourself to God or to anyone, you can't serve or grow. You just can't muster up the energy to do anything meaningful you may not even be able to show yourself any grace and compassion. You have no capacity for even the slightest action. Your inner being is barely existing at all. 
And how morbid that sounds until you hear and see that the power of God is given to us who believes. The death-breaking, incomparable power of God is given to us in our lives, in all the ways that it would otherwise keep dying and decaying until it was nothing. One of my favorite stories depicting God's power in a very tangible way is that of Elisha and his servant waking up one morning to a massive Armenian army surrounding them. Of course the servant panics, that would be me. He may not know this about me, but often my panic and stress is the fuel for my internal battles. Those close to me can see it. It leaks into my outside world. Oh no, what are we going to do? Is it ever going to be okay again? I don't see a way forward. It may even look like giving up on a dream or a hopeful outcome. And so often that is us. Maybe it's you too. Looking at the powerful forces around you, threatening our safety, security, sanity, well-being. Oh no, South Africa is in trouble. Oh no, my job is at risk. I don't see a future for my children. I've been diagnosed with a terminal disease. My marriage is about to end. All these very real threats and are very scary giants to face. But Elisha, when facing the forceful army in front of him, simply says, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. More or less, God is more powerful and we get to tap into that power. The story goes that the servant's eyes are opened and he sees these chariots of fire and horses on the hills around them. A display of the power of God that is always accessible to us, but now made visible to the servant's eyes. Elisha has taken to heart that God's power is at work in his people, so he confidently asks God to make his enemy blind. And then he leads them to Samaria where the battle is won peacefully and God's rulership is affirmed. I don't know if your victory will come now or sometime before you die or after your earthly death, but you are not alone. God's power in your life is greater than any other. You are not living some half alive, half dead life, or you don't need to be. You are living the life of his resurrected body with him daily. And that is the power of a life with him. He is the one who strengthens. And now there is no limit to what he can do through you. As he energizes us, we realize it's not only someday when our physical bodies need resurrection, but that we are brought to life now, when our spiritual beings need constant revival so that it is possible for us to live the life he gives. He breathes life into us and raises us from the dead. And it shows from disintegration to integration. All of our lives can come together as relevant and meaningful in his hands. Every part of who we are and what we do is important to him. And as we realize that, our lives begin to make sense. From numb to aware, our sensitivity to beauty and joy and goodness, even to what is unjust and evil, increases. It's almost as if our spiritual senses are awakened. Our awareness of him and his heart for the world grows. You are no longer dead inside, apathetic, but moved and touched and able to see and hear God around you in your everyday life. From lifeless to activated. Your limbs have life again and you can do something. You can try, you can pray, you can pitch up to your own life because you have life pulsing through your veins. You can have that difficult conversation. You can be vulnerable in prayer. You begin to serve some way. You can open up to someone in a relationship. You can give, you can listen, you can grow. Because you have been resurrected. The same power that brought Jesus to life is working in you and bringing you more and more to life in all the ways God can now. We see that he gives us access to energy. As you step into a life with God and follow in his footsteps, 
He energizes us in very specific ways. We are his body, intimately connected to him as source. We receive gifts of the spirit and experience life tapped into the relational and powerful God. But God also blesses the world with what we may call common grace, undeserved goodness and beauty for everyone. Look around you. God is in nature. He is in people, even those who think and believe differently to us. He's in the solutions that should not have been possible. In leadership who suddenly makes a call for the good. He is in conversations, in situations. He's working through the doctor who treats you as you struggle with a terrible diagnosis or the therapist working with you on a journey towards mental health. He is in the advisor who works at a plan with you for financial health. He is in the businessman who launches a project for food security, whether or not that person knows he's instrumental in God's hands. His power is working through organizations, systems, people, products. He energizes even the most unlikely instruments and works his undeserved goodness into this world all over. He's creative. Why would we not expect him to be really resourceful in how he touches and changes the world? So we get to begin to see God's rulership even now, even amidst brokenness and corruption, even amongst those who do not yet know or understand or accept. His incredible, immense power moves in and amongst us. Yet sometimes we choose to not use what he gives and not to, to not access that, but to let other energies fuel us. Toxic, toxic energy, for example, bitterness, revenge, unforgiveness, entitlement, victim mentality, mindsets that feel a certain way of living, or negative energy. Things will always be this way. Everything is hopeless. Again, this mindset feels a certain way of living. What we feel shape our thoughts and what we think affect our emotions. And as we heard before, emotion is energy in motion. So what energy drives you? What thoughts and emotions fuel you? The verse just before our reading says, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so you can understand. What is going on in our hearts? that which we think and feel. Because that seems to be key to what energy fuels us. So Paul says in Romans 12 verse two, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God gives us access to his energy. Draw on that, turn your heart to that, soak your thoughts in that, tap into that life. And how? Invest in your relationship with Jesus. Philippians 2 verse 12 to 13 says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. On the one hand, you've got agency, you've got a part to play, but on the other hand, only through God working in you can you even want to do it and can you be transformed to a life with him. So keep turning to the source to access this energy rather than being plugged into the artificial and meek flow that the world suggests. Do this by reading God's word prayerfully and letting it sink into you. Read it daily, read it slowly, digesting what God is saying to you. Meditate on the truth of his word and his life in your life. Consider how his word integrates with your life. Let it shape your thoughts and affect your emotions. And pray continually and pray intentionally. Do it simply as you can. Every prayer is turning towards your source and opening up to his power settling in you. Let his power displace any other power that has found a way to drive or consume you. Paul says he is stronger than any ruler or authority or leader. And as you begin to transform your thoughts, you may want to pray a grace as your heart song. Lord, 
give me the grace of surrendering only to your power and allowing that energy to fuel my life. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this amazing life that you give us access to. Thank you for letting your power affect our lives, for creating in us this energy with which we move and breathe and live. Lord, help us to turn to you, to choose you, to open up to your word and your transforming love. Thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The love of God our Father, the grace of Jesus Christ his Son, and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit will be with each of us. Amen.